Okay, hi, I'm Damon Morelli. I know it's been a little while since I've last posted a video. Um, I uh, have no excuse. Um, so this is the fifth video in my Life and Learning Systems series. This one will be focusing on the human speech code, and we will be particularly looking at the work, uh, reviewing the work of Pierre E. O'Dyer. Um, and hopefully later in this series, I'll also be able to touch on some of his other work uh, that's not related to the speech code, but related to um, motivation and learning systems. Some really interesting stuff. I think you'll hear a lot more about Pierre, um, uh, Mr. Professor O'Dyer, um, in, in the years to come. He, and he's a, a, um, a disciple, protege of Luke Steele's, who we'll look at next week. Uh, Luke Steele's is a giant in the field. Um, uh, in the field of artificial intelligence and how it relates to language and learning sys and learning systems, uh, I, you know, I won't, I will not be surprised if we see him w winning some uh, very prestigious awards in the near, very near future. Um, so, uh, I will also try to um, integrate the slides from my presentation into the video, so that way you don't have to go and and um, you know. Uh, open up the, the presentation yourself. I've had several people ask me about this. Uh, I'll try to do it. We'll see if it works. Um, so, uh, the human speech code, right, is this mutually shared phonetic uh, system, of mutually shared phonetic sounds, uh, and it's, it is one of the primary building blocks of, of uh, human language. Um, and in his work in the self-organization of speech, uh, Pierre O'Dyer, he seeks to explain how this, how a coordinated speech code uh, could have emerged between humans um, before there was any established linguistic system uh, or any established linguistic communication. Um, so how could this have organized itself uh, without the express intent of providing some kind of linguistic system um, and without uh, the existence of a linguistic system. Really interesting uh, stuff. Okay, so um, Pierre, um, he, he focuses on, again, self-organization. He, arg he uh, argues, quote, that uh, Self-organization, I'm sorry, self-organization is, quote, the touchstone of the paradigm shift driven by the complexity sciences, end of quote. Um, and again, this idea of self-organization is that you have subsystems that are interacting with each other in various ways, in kind of ongoing dynamic ways, and uh, you will uh, macro properties um, macro patterns will emerge from the interactions of, this ver of these various subsystems and the, these macro properties are qualitatively different than the qualities of the subsystems. So uh, for example um, in regards to speech is that how might you have um, systems such as your sublaryngeal tract uh, your auditory system, your neuronal system, how might these be interacting in ways uh, in addition to, with, with other uh, units of those, of those systems, and how might you then get something that emerges such as um, a, a mutually coordinated uh, speech code um, in which the, none, of these, none of these subsystems were specifically designed to do this. Um, uh, the, again, the, the example, he uses the kind of uh, standard example of the termite mound. Uh, we, we, these termite mounds that we find um, have very intricate systems to them. Uh, they have um, air conditioning, ventilation systems are, are part of these termite mounds. Um, you, you get these... Um, uh, various kind of rooms, specific rooms within a termite mound, within a termite colony, and yet the blueprint for these um, termite mounds are not inside the termite, as far as we know. Um, so how might 
this kind of this this standard phenomena of the termite mound, how might that come about? How might that emerge? And again, the idea here is that you have these termites interacting with other termites on very large scales within the environmental context, and from that you actually get the emergence of, uh, of, a, of a termite mound that has these um, characteristics, these rooms, these ventilation shafts, uh, that are qualitatively different than the individual um, subunits, the individual termites. Um, <clears throat> so the idea, yeah, so hopefully you get that. Um, now, um, Pierre E.O. Dyer, he really stresses that um, given the quantity and integration of, of, the, of various elements of linguistics, is that linguistics must be an interdisciplinary field. Um, there are so many different elements going on to result in the phenomena of language that this really cannot be a field relegated only to linguists or people who just focus on you know, formal elements of language and things like that, um, or even you know, just applied elements of language. Um, so uh, he says that focusing on uh, particular isolated components obscures uh, a more complete understanding of the kind of major phenomenon going on in, in um, the major phenomenon of language. And he says that fortunately, uh, particularly uh, in recent years, uh, neuroscience and cognitive science has really opened the doors uh, of linguistics to biology. Uh, so now no longer is linguistics purely this kind of field in which uh, we reason, we rationalize, we use kind of this deductive reasoning to work out our theories, and then whoever has kind of the best arguing deductive reasoning skills is the person who wins, is that now with cognitive science we're really able to better evaluate um, the various theories that are put, linguistic theories that are put out there. Um, and, he, and he says here that because linguistic phenomena um, involve a wide variety of systems working in synchronization, is that we then need mathematicians, theoretical biologists, and researchers in the field of artificial intelligence to construct operational models for which we can then test the available theories. Um, and, and he stresses that these artificial models that we build, um, you know, we try to construct artificial models that reflect our, our best understanding of how you know, uh, the human biological system works, you know, physiological system works, and yet at the same time though, is that we're not saying that, oh, this artificial system is how it is is how the human system is. We're not suggesting that. He, he stresses that, that any um, understanding that we take from these artificial systems is analogous. It is, at its basis, a meta, you know, metaphoric. Um, um, and yet, at the same time, though, we, you know, it is useful. Um, so, <clears throat> um, Odair is trying to rectify um, a couple of kind of really contradictory elements of language uh, and, and speech code. Par I'm sorry, particular, he's trying to rectify kind of contradictory elements of speech uh, that we find is that the, really the range, the range of speech is, uh, is very wide. It's possibly infinite uh, in regards to the um, different points that, that you could um, hit on and, and utilize within uh, uh, that, that the speech could use. And yet at the same time though, it does seem that speech falls into um, uh, kind of falls into these kind of discrete units. Um, and these discrete units uh, kind of represent statistical regularities. And these statistical regularities are identifiable across across human speech throughout the world. And yet at the same time though, we also have, there's also an element of variability between speech communities. So he's really trying to rectify um, these characteristics of speech. You know, these kind of, the standardization of speech, and yet at the same time though, the flexibility of speech. The, the kind of these 
overarching patterns, and yet at the same time, though, within these overarching patterns, there's still a level of variability. And, and so he's using self-organization and his models as a way of maybe beginning to rectify that. Um, and again, hopefully you can see parallels with uh, my first um, presentation where we really looked at, um, you know, uh, particularly pink noise um, and how, you know, pink noise exhibits this kind of, um, you know, inter, this kind of, uh, uh, balance between interdependence and in independence that, uh, that occurs within living systems. Um, another main point um, that, that Odyer is um, uh, using self-organization to, to support or um, to kind of validate possibly um, so the, the results of his work in this area suggest that simple biological and social mechanisms can actually account for the formation of speech code, um, shared acoustic codes within communities, uh, which can then be uh, exapted or um, recruited through the process of exaptation for speech communication. Okay, so what we mean there is that the phenomenon of a coordinated speech code um, is not specifically for language. And I know that this is really hard for people to accept. Um, but at the same time, though, is that once that coordination of speech code occurs within a community, it certainly then can be harnessed um, and certainly plays a role in the process of bootstrapping you know, linguistic ability. Um, you know, for the purpose, for, um, for the phenomena of language. Um, and this idea of exaptation um, is uh, fairly prevalent in biology. Um, uh, for example, um, uh, studies of fossils show, show that feathers existed before flight. Um, so feathers were likely actually um, provided a kind of insulating effect for various species, and yet over um, and yet the feathers also end up uh, providing a kind of uh, they seem to be very beneficial for allowing flight as well. Um, so again, is that the, the characteristics of this of feathers, which provided insulation, also ended up being kind of exapted or recruited or harnessed for um, the function of flight, similar with, we might find with language, uh, with uh, coordinated speech codes uh, being harnessed uh, for, uh, into linguistic systems. <clears throat> okay, so now we'll get to uh, his artificial system that he constructed. Um, and again, his artificial system is, in, quote, inspired by um, end of quote, uh, and modeled after the relevant human systems. So what he's modeled his system after is that we have the uh, laryngeal, supralaryngeal system of the human, and this is connected to uh, our brain, the neuronal system, and which is also connected to our auditory system. And so every time the auditory system is stimulated, um, of course there's a region of the brain that is stimulated and uh, and then this also then stimulates a gesture, um, and this this has been researched and established. Um, of course, you know when you hear something, you're not always you know you don't speak it. Um, these these gestures are repressed um, again, likely within the prefrontal cortex and somehow. Um, but anyways, so uh, so he has this artificial system in which. Uh, the, the auditory system receives um, um, incoming sound um, and it registers uh, 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 within registers the first four formants, which uh, formants are in the human auditory system are kind of the um, frequencies. Um, human sounds are not uh, are complex sounds. They're not pure. They're not pure waves. Pure wave frequencies. Uh, he then consolidates the the four the he has the first form and he then consolidates the the next three formants down into a into a uh, a second 
into a kind of art, uh, effective second effect, what he calls a second effective formant. Uh, so that way he can then model it on a two-dimensional uh, space, uh, which um, uh, they're using a, a two-dimensional uh, Hebbian, Hebbian model, it, which again, a Hebbian model, I think I've mentioned it before, the Hebbian model is that you have um, nodes and the nodes are connected and when uh, the connections between nodes are, are stimulated is that those connections then become stronger or in this case they, um, the nodes then uh, move closer together. Um, so he has a vocal tract system um, in which they model this um, trajectory of speech uh, production which uh, the, the, large, the most significant components of that are your, your, lip, your lip rounding, ah, e, o, um, your tongue height, na, da, ga, uh, and tongue position as well. Uh, and these are, again, these are actually modeled in relation to the first four formants. Um, and again, then they're then connected together in a two-dimensional modeling space that's supposed to be representative of the, of the neuronal system. Okay, so what, they, what he ends up doing in this experiment, though, is that we have uh, one agent and maybe as many as 20 other agents, and they will produce sounds at random. And given these structures, these biological structures, the superlaryngeal structure, the auditory structure, the neuronal structure, um, is that through these random... Um, uh, vocalizations and random aid, other agents will hear these random vocalizations. So of a group of maybe a population of 20 agents, um, one individual will create a, at one individual at random, one ind individual agent at random will create a vocalization. Another individual agent at random will hear this vocalization. And, th and through just running this, um, this random process, in a variety of iterations, um, you actually end up getting a coordination uh, within the neural uh, within the neural map. You, get, you end up getting a coordination of of um, frequencies uh, that are that are commonly used. So um, the the random vocalizations end up being then constrained into this kind of mutually shared. Um, uh, mutually shared vocalization that is then shared within the community. And so here, uh, for example, the initially random two-dimensional neural map uh, indicating, again, the first two formants collapses into these regional clusters. And these, uh, these clusters you end up seeing are highly coordinated with uh, among agents. So here, for example, we have two agents, agent one, agent two, and we can see that where the clustering occurs for these uh, of these formants are very very similar, and then he then brings in uh, what he calls his his realist. I think he calls it his realistic model. Um, <clears throat> uh, he so he uh, he uses what he calls an improved articulatory model uh, to accommodate the nonlinearities of the human vocal apparatus. And, but when he does this, when he integrates this, uh, this improved articulatory model, um, we get uh, uh, the kind of uh, um, the clustering that then occurs among the individuals falls into, um, for most of his experiments, falls into uh, these primarily five clusters, five regional clusters that if you can see are here, 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 and here, and here. Um, here's an overall um, uh, frequency distribution of, of how many vowel kind of clusters end up resulting from his experiments when he tries to make this a more realistic model. You see primarily five, uh, sometimes six uh, for, his, for his system. 
Uh, sometimes four, four is also quite common. And then he then compares this um, to a, a language database of, of vowel sounds, uh, um, I think out of UCLA. Uh, yeah, I, I don't remember where it's from, but anyways. Um, and uh, what, what, what he finds is that with, when, he, when he then uses the, this artificial system that's you know, as our, using our best knowledge of the way that you know, the human constructing a model that um, best tries to mimic or imitate um, or that is again inspired by the human system and you, and you have these, these subsystems, the art, uh, auditory system with the neural system, with the sublaryngeal system, and these are kind of then uh, allowed to kind of interact together, and then you get the clustering effects that occur uh, of these formants, uh, is that it ends up matching quite well with, right here, we see the 25% uh, of all the human languages uh, that is uh, 351 languages that are in this uh, database, 25% um, of them exhibit uh, five vowels, which again, five is the most uh, common outcome within his, within his model. So it's just kind of interesting that, um, that once he uh, accommodates for some nonlinearities within the articulatory system, his model ends up really kind of supporting uh, what we actually end up finding in the real world. And again, 15% of the languages, uh, 351 languages in this database, um, you know, 15% have, have four vowels, um, which again, coordinates quite well uh, with, with the results of his, of his work. Um, so, uh, in conclusion, uh, hopefully we'll finish quickly here. Um, so, this particular work of Odeyer kind of provides a possible route for how speech code, given pre-existing non-linguistic biological constraints, could have been self-organized within a group of individuals who did not possess coordinated speech faculties beforehand. This is um, a really um, interesting uh, kind of empirical support um, against certain proposed um, linguistic positions and in support that supports certain proposed linguistic positions. Uh, and he argues that uh, his presented framework offers a plausible explanation for the, for the language, for the quote, language bootstrapping problems that, you know, again, how do we get these kind of language, linguistic faculties without them pre-existing or without, again, some sort of magical genetic mutation. Uh, quote, indeed, we show that natural selection did not necessarily have to find the genomes which pre-programmed the brain in precise and specific ways so as to create and learn discrete speech systems, end of quote. And, and yet the, I find, I feel that really the, the real beauty of his work really lies with, with its proposition that the mechanism of self-organization can account for these kind of seemingly incongruent properties of speech code, like, like the discreteness, universals, and diversity. And I also really uh, like uh, how it really as well points to the social element, is that the coordination, is again, he's not, he's not um, uh, certainly, again, certainly the biology plays a role, and providing the kind of similarities of the, you know, the structure, the sub subsystems that then allow for the coordination of the speech. But again, the, also the role of, of the, the social interaction in the self-organization, self-organizing process. Okay, um, so next week we're going to look at, or next video, oh, maybe I'll get around to it today, um, we'll be looking at um, how this self-organizing self process using somewhat kind of similar models, not exactly, um, can result in coordination of categories and linguistic categorization, um, shared linguistic categorization of, of uh, perceptual categories. Um, some work by Luke Steeles, and then we'll then, uh, this will lead us into um, Lakoff and Johnson's work 
uh, on the role of metaphor. Um, and, and again, then hopefully we'll perpetuate this further into kind of um, um, the idea of like social, the social, social learning of knowledge. Okay, um, I know I get a little rambly. I uh, uh, apologize for that. Take care of yourself. I'll see you soon. Bye.